But our next speaker, isn't that great preparation for you, Andy? <laughs> but of course, Andy's the exception. And um, he's going to be presenting uh, Jesus and the Rapture. And Andy Woods is the only guy to ever win the Bible Exposition Award twice at Dallas Seminary. And uh, he has a master's and PhD from there. And he is a professor at... Call it. I don't know what that is, but it's not good. College of Biblical Studies in Houston. Yes, I always don't get that right. But, uh, and he's also pastor of Sugarland Bible Church. And uh, isn't that where they kept the prisoners used to? Yeah, Sugarland's where they used to keep the prisoners, you know, uh, if they weren't uh, stationed in Huntsville. When I was a boy, my mother always, in Texas, everybody knows what, what I'm talking about here. She said, if you don't straighten up, you're going to end up in Huntsville. <laughs> right? So, um, Sugarland used to be where they would work. In fact, uh, the state of Texas used to, the inmates paid their own way. Uh, uh, you know, by working on the farms and factories that they had. And then some federal judge from East Texas named Judge Justice in the late 80s decided that the Texas penal system was cruel and unusual punishment and so we became like everybody else where the taxpayers now pay for the prisoners upkeep instead of them paying for their own but that I don't know how that got worked into your paper <laughs> but ne nevertheless uh, that that's true and so uh, Dr. Wood uh, has written two, his master's thesis and his doctoral dissertation on issues related to eschatology, and he's, he's a real expert on these areas, so I'm happy for him to come and present Jesus and the Rapture. Well, thank you. Uh, how's the mic doing? Pretty good? If we could take our Bibles and open them, it's going to be a tough session. It's what we call the Prince and Power of the Air, I guess, at work. All right, John uh, chapter 14 and verses 1 through 4. Uh, the title of this session is Jesus in the Rapture. If you're following along on the paper, I you want to start on page 19. Uh, I tried to deal with Matthew 24 in the first part of the paper, and I would have a little gentle disagreement with uh, Dr. Hart on that. If you want another point of view, you could read sometime on your own the first uh, 19 pages of uh, my paper. but. Really what I'm focused on in this session is Jesus and the rapture from John 14, verses 1 through 4. Did Jesus Christ ever refer to the rapture? And uh, I think we need to understand the theological climate that we find ourselves in. Uh, we're in the midst of a climate where people are denying the rapture. How's this work? All right, sounds a little better. Um, we're living in a climate where people, uh, by and large, are denying there is such a thing as the rapture, as you all know. And one of the things that's happening is, as I'm reading articles and so forth, people don't believe John 14, 1 through 4, is the rapture at all. They think that we're reading our theology into the text rather than taking our theology from the text. So what I'd like to do uh, this, this afternoon, this morning, is to defend the idea that John 14 verses 1 through 4 is indeed 
the rapture. John 14 verses 1 through 4. This is out of the NASB, so sorry about that. But it says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way uh, where I am going. I think we can uh, defend the rapture in this uh, passage by looking at three things. Uh, Number one, we want to look at some preliminary reasons. Number two, we want to attempt an exegesis, if we can, of of John 14, verses 1 through 4. And then number three, we want to interact with the competing positions that say this passage has nothing to do with the rapture. So let's start with some preliminary reasons. I think even before we come to the text of John 14, verses 1 through 4, before we look at it, I think there's some preliminary observations we can make which should lead an an unbiased interpreter to an openness to a rapture understanding uh, of these verses. Um, The preliminary reasons are, number one, the significance of the upper room discourse. Number two, the eschatological flavor of the upper room discourse. Number three, the, early, the writings of the early church fathers. Number four, the Jewish marriage analogy. And number five, a key parallel with another rapture text. text. Let's start with uh, the significance of the upper room discourse. Of course, John 13 through 17 is the upper room discourse in which our passage appears. And it's very helpful to sort of step back and look at where the upper room discourse appears in John's gospel. John's gospel has at least five major sections to it. First of all, we have a genealogy. I believe it's a heavenly genealogy which links Jesus back to heaven. Every gospel writer except for Mark has some kind of genealogy. And I believe John includes that to show the identity of Jesus Christ. Then you move to the end of chapter 1 through the end of chapter 11. And that's the longest section of John's gospel. And that's what we call his, uh, the book of signs, his public ministry. And it basically centers around the seven uh, signs that Jesus did. The first being the water to wine at Canaan, the last one being Lazarus' resurrection, and seven discourses. And then when you move to John chapter 12, you have the triumphal entry. And the triumphal entry is, I think, the time in John's gospel where it becomes very apparent that the leadership of the nation of Israel is not going to embrace Jesus Christ. In fact, I think the turning point in John's gospel is John 12, 37 which says, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. So it's very apparent that national Israel is moving off into discipline, which will take place in AD 70. But as we know, there's a remnant of Jewish believers who will become the church uh, in Acts chapter 2. And so... Then we move to the next section, John 13 through 17, which is the upper room discourse. And now Jesus is with the disciples in the upper room, and I think he is revealing there a new age, a new period of time. National Israel is on the shelf for a season, and the church age is about to start. And so I think Jesus is preparing these disciples for the church age, and this is where Jesus begins to disclose Uh, many truths in seed form which the uh, epistolary literature will water and amplify. Lewis Berry Chafer uh, on the uh, Upper Room Discourse says this, the upper room in which the above passage is found is the seed plot of that form of doctrine which is later developed in the epistles. It is not strange, therefore, that the Apostle Paul would take up this great theme for further uh, elucidation. 
And as you go through the Upper Room Discourse, and I got this, most of these uh, verses from Dr. Chafer, his systematic theology, but I believe you see most of the doctrines that are developed in the epistles in the Upper Room Discourse in sort of germ form or seed form. Examples would be the believer's oneness in Christ, John 17, verses 20 through 23. Paul makes a big deal of that in Ephesians 2, verses 11 and 12. The, the Spirit's permanent residence in the believer, John 14, verse 16. Paul makes a big deal of that in Ephesians 4.30. The believer's union with Christ, John 14.20. Uh, Paul makes a big deal about that in Romans 6. The believer's opposition to the world, how the world will hate the believer, John 15, verses 18 and 19. That becomes a very prominent theme in the epistles, James 4.4 4 and other verses. The necessity to stay in fellowship with Christ, John 13, verse 10. That's a big deal in John's uh, uh, epistles that he writes later on. And we could go on and on with these ideas. I have several slides on it, but don't have time to read all of them. But abiding in Christ, the believer's election, Christ is the ultimate model of sacrificial living, the necessity of divine discipline, Satan is the God of this age, the defeat of Satan at the cross, <clears throat> the Spirit as the inspirer of all Scripture, the Spirit is the illuminator of all Scripture, Christ's uh, provision of peace in the midst of adversity, the necessity of the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, and on and on we could go. So it's in this sense that I think the Upper Room Discourse is very different than the Olivet Discourse. I asked one of my students, uh, or the students, why do we call it the Olivet Discourse? And one guy said, well, we get all of it. And that probably is not the right answer. <laughs> but the Olivet Discourse, as you know, takes place in the Mount of Olives. The Upper Room Discourse takes place in the Upper Room. The scripture for the Olivet Discourse is Matthew 24 and 25. The Upper Room Discourse is in John 13 through 17. According to the Ryrie Study Bible, must be right, I found it in the Ryrie Study Bible, uh, the Olivet Discourse takes place on the third day of the Passion Week, the Upper Room Discourse on the sixth day. The focus, I believe, of the Olivet Discourse is national Israel, where the focus of the Upper Room Discourse is the church. It's Christ's farewell address to the church. Christ in the Olivet Discourse is focusing on Israel's future, but in the Upper Room, he's primarily focused on divine provisions in the age of the church. What prompted the Olivet Discourse was Christ's prediction of the temple's destruction. What prompted the Upper Room Discourse is Christ's prediction of his imminent departure. The Olivet Discourse is an amplification of Old Testament passages, specifically Daniel 9, verse 27. I also believe Jeremiah 30, verse 7. But the focus of the Upper Room Discourse is unwritten New Testament material yet to be written in the epistles. So if Chafer is right on this, that the Upper Room Discourse reveals truths for the church age in seed form, then it wouldn't be a big shock, would it, if Christ also revealed how the age of the church will end in John 14, verses 1 through 4. A second preliminary observation has to do with the eschatological flavor of the Upper Room Discourse. One of the criticisms of seeing a rapture in John 14 verses 1 through 4 is people say, well, the Upper Room Discourse is not focused on eschatology. And that's true, there's not as much eschatology in John 13 through 17 as there is in Matthew 24 and 25, but John, as you go through his book and, and read his discourse, makes many eschatological statements. John in John 5, 29 talks about the two resurrections, which is a big deal in Daniel 12, too. He talks about, I believe, Israel's future acceptance of an antichrist in lieu of the true Christ, John 5, 43. He talks about Christ's promise to resurrect the believer in the last day, John 6, John 11. And even in the Upper Room Discourse itself, John makes an eschatological statement where he talks about the coming of the Spirit who will disclose things to come. When I saw that language in the Bible, I said, Dr. Pentecost, John stole the title of your book there, Things to, things to Come. So there is eschatology in uh, 
the upper room discourse. Now, it's likely that Jesus could have revealed a lot more eschatology in John 13 through 17, which uh, uh, Jesus could have revealed more, but John simply omitted it and didn't disclose it. Because John is one of the great writers of the Bible that tells us why he wrote his book. John 20, verses 30 and 31 is the purpose statement of the book. It says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John has a Christological reason for writing, trying to prove that Jesus is the Son of God, and he has a soteriological purpose in writing which is to get people to believe in Jesus Christ and consequently experience the gift of life. So John tells us that he leaves out a lot of things that Jesus said and did. He says that in the very last uh, verse of the book. It, it says in John 21, 25, there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that were, would be written therein. So, my point is, there is a eschatological flavor of the Upper Room Discourse. And there could have even be a lot more eschatology that John simply chose to omit from his writing as he was guided by the Spirit of God because they weren't germane to his purpose in writing. Uh, a third preliminary observation has to do with the early church fathers. Uh, Dr. George Gunn, who's sitting right here, gave a very good paper on this to our group in 2006. And in that paper, he identified uh, five anti-Nicene church fathers who interpreted John 14 verses 1 through 4 in a heavenly and eschatological sense. In other words, they did not embrace some of the views I'll share later that John 14, 1 through 4 is uh, the resurrection or the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So, Papias, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian. And George Gunn makes this observation. Interestingly, the references to John 14, 1 through 3 virtually disappear when perusing the writings of the Nicene and post-Nicene church fathers. This is a bit surprising given the abundance of material in these later uh, writers when compared to the anti-Nicenes. I would assume that the rise of Augustinian amillennial, amillennialism and its optimistic interpretation regarding the present arrival of the kingdom of God, uh, the kind of help held, held up held out in John 14, 1 through 3, cease to hold relevance. So prior to Augustinian amillennialism, you do have those who interpret John 14, verses 1 through 4 in a heavenly and eschatological sense. A fourth uh, preliminary observation has to do with the Jewish marriage analogy. Uh, Dr. Showers, Renald Showers, in his book Maranatha, uh, basically identifies, and most commentators that I read go this direction, the seven phases of the Jewish marriage. And these are analogous to our relationship to Christ. I know we could quibble about some of the details, but in general, they are, number one, the marriage covenant. Uh, this is the covenant uh, established upon the payment of the price by the groom to the bride's father. Then you have a bridal chamber being prepared. This is where the groom returns to the father's house to prepare bridal, the bridal chamber. Then you have the retrieving of the bride, the fetching of the bride. The groom returns at an unknown time to retrieve his bride. And then you have other things mentioned there, the bridal cleansing, uh, the wedding ceremony, the consummation of the marriage, the marriage feast. And the only reason I bring this up is because John 14, 2 and 3 fits steps 2 and 3 really well. It's sort of too close of a connection to just dismiss. So Christ's death on the cross would be the marriage covenant. 
And then when the groom returns to the father's house to prepare uh, the bridal chamber, that is very good description of John 14, 2, where we have Christ's uh, uh, preparation <clears throat> from uh, separation, excuse me, from his disciples through his ascension and his return to heaven to prepare dwelling places. And then we have uh, the next phase, which is the groom comes at an unknown time to retrieve the bride. That's a pretty good description of John 14, verse 3, the rapture of the church. And those other points, uh, you could read those on your own. So there are things that are happening even before we approach the text that give us an openness to a rapture interpretation of these passages. The fifth and final preliminary observation has to do with a parallel with another rapture passage. Uh, most people, even our opponents, agree that our strongest passage is in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18. And uh, uh, J.B. Smith, uh, and Tommy mentioned this in the Q&A session yesterday, uh, has an interesting chart where he parallels the vocabulary and the concepts and the chronology of John 14 verses 1 through 4 with 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18. And there's an eerie uh, a connection, not only in terms of vocabulary, Sometimes it's just in terms of concept, but there's also a chronological connection. And uh, according to Ronald Schauer's book, there's eight other interpreters that have seen this parallel as well. So Jesus says in John 14, 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Paul says, do not, you know, sorrow in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Jesus says, believe. John 14, 1, Paul says, believe. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. Paul says, believe in Jesus, believe in God. Jesus says, I told you. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, I say to you by the word of the Lord. Jesus in John 14, 3 uses the expression, come again. Uh, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15 refers to the coming of the Lord. Jesus says, I will receive you to myself, verse 3. Paul says we will be caught up, uh, harpazo, verse 17. Jesus says, I will receive you to myself. Paul says when we are caught up, verse 17, we will meet the Lord. Uh, Paul, uh, Jesus says, but where I am, uh, you will be with me. And, and Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 says, we will forever be with the Lord. So you take a look at some of these preliminary observations. And I think if, we're, if people are unbiased on the subject, there are things that are happening that should create in us an openness to a rapture understanding. I mean, it shouldn't be any great shock to find the rapture in John 14, verses 1 through 4. We have the significance of the upper room discourse in terms of laying out doctrine in seed form. We have the eschatological flavor of the discourse. We have some writings from some early church fathers. We have a parallel with the Jewish marriage analogy. And we also have a parallel with uh, some other, uh, another important rapture text. So let's move to part two of this presentation, and we actually want to get into now John 14, verses 1 through 4, and look at it and see, does this text actually support a rapture uh, interpretation? So let's start, if we could, with verse 1. We won't spend too much time on verse 1. We'll come back to verse 1 a little bit later. But verse 1 says, do not let your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. So Christ, what triggers this discourse is Christ's announcement of his departure, which terrified the disciples, John 13, 1. And so Jesus is seeking to comfort them here in John 14, uh, verses 1 through 4. And then we move to verse 2. Verse 2 says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. So there are three things we need to understand in this verse. Number one, what does it mean by my Father's house? Number two, what is this expression, many dwellings? What does that mean? Number three, what is the expression, I go? What exactly uh, 
does that mean? So let's start with uh, my father's house. What does my father's house mean? Well, there's a lot of ink that spilled on trying to understand my father's house. To me, the simplest uh, definition of it or the simplest understanding of it is the father's house is the unique heavenly dwelling where God lives. Uh, as you go through the Bible, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, when it mentions God, it mentions that he's in heaven. Deuteronomy 6 verse, uh, 26 verse 15 says, Look down from your holy habitation from heaven. Psalm uh, 33 uh, uh, verses 13 and 14 says, The Lord looks from heaven. So Isaiah 63 verse 15 says, Look down from heaven and see your holy and glorious habitation. Matthew 5 45 says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Of course, we know the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer. Pray in this way, our Father who art, art in uh, heaven. So he the Father's house is, in my understanding, the unique heavenly dwelling where God lives. It's the place where Jesus Christ ascended back to. John uh, 17, verse Five, Jesus makes this statement in the Upper Room Discourse. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Uh, Jesus is, Psalm 119, verse 10, seated at the right hand of God. Revelation 3, verse 21 indicates that he is on the Father's throne. Not David's throne, by the way. Father's throne. That's an, another sermon for another time. So the Father's house is the unique dwelling where Christ ascended to. Uh, and then we have this expression, uh, many, well, the King James Version says many mansions. And I really don't want to wreck a lot of good preaching and singing. But the idea of mansions comes from the Latin. Any commentator will tell you this. It comes from a Latin word in the Latin Vulgate picked up by Tyndale when he translated the Bible into English and consequently made its way into the King James Version. The Greek here is not mansions, it's the Greek word mone. Mone basically believes a temporary dwelling. Uh, TDNT uh, calls mone a uh, watch house. Uh, most of the commentators that you read on this are gonna quote a guy named Pausanias, if I'm pronouncing that right, who uh, use that expression in classical uh, Greek literature of, of an inn. And I think one of the reasons why uh, the word mone is used rather than a mansion or something like that is I think Jesus is trying to communicate that our heavenly abode with him after the rapture is only temporary. Our ultimate destination is the earth. I mean, our sojourn with him in heaven and the things that will go on there for seven years are very important, they're very critical, they're just not our ultimate destination. Revelation 5 verse 10 says we will reign upon uh, the earth. And then we have this next expression, I go. Uh, what does that mean, I, I go? And I think what it means is Jesus came from heaven uh, clearly we see that in John 17 verse 5 we see it in John 16 verse 28 where Jesus says I came forth from the Father and have come into the world and so I think what it indicates is Jesus Christ is going back to the heaven from which he came it's a very dominant theme in John's gospel John 14, verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do greater works than these, because I go to the Father. John 16, 28, I am leaving the world again and going back uh, to the Father. So when it says I go there, I think what it's talking about is the ascension of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Greek word, there I go, uh, poriomai, is used in Acts 1, verses 10 and 11, and 1 Peter 3, verse 22, for Christ's ascension. So what can we conclude here from John 14 and verse 2? It teaches that Christ will return uh, 
to the very heaven from which he came in order to prepare temporary dwellings for his disciples. Now, then we go to verse 3. Verse 3 is packed with information. Uh, Verse 3 says, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So there are probably at least five expressions and or words that need to be understood here. Uh, The word phrase, I will come, the word again, the phrase and receive you to myself, the preposition to, and then this uh, word uh, where. So sort of taking these one by one, the first thing that you see here is this phrase he uses there in verse three, I will come again. The Greek word there I think is erkomai. And one of the debates about this is that's in the present tense, and people say, aha, how could this be talking about some future rapture when Jesus uses that word in the present tense? Well, there is something in Greek called the futuristic present. Uh, Dan Wallace in his uh, Greek grammar uh, says this, the present tense may be used to describe a future reality. The present tense may describe an event that is wholly subsequent to the time of speaking, although as if it were present. Only an examination of the context will help one see whether this use of the present tense stresses immediacy or certainty. So there are some things in God's mind that are so certain that he could speak of them in the present tense, although they're a future reality. Uh, Linsky uh, says this, the present tense, I come, is used rather than the future, for the return is regarded not as a distant event, but as, but as one ever imminent or at hand. Another reason for the futuristic present there. And in fact, when you take a look at the present tense of this word, erkomai, I am coming, you see John using it all of the time in the present tense to explain a future reality. Remember, John wrote five books, not just the Gospel of John, but also the three epistles of John and the book of Revelation. And he keeps saying, using the present tense, erkomai, all of the time to describe Christ's future coming. Now, the next word that's important to understand is this little adverb again, uh, Pauline, I think is how you pronounced it. I was pronouncing it Palin, but I didn't want to sound too political or anything like that. (laughs) But what does this this little adverb mean, uh, again? Well, I think it means a couple things. Jesus Christ is going to come back in the same way in which he left. Uh, Linsky says this, the coming again is the counterpart of the going away. Visibly, Jesus ascends. Visibly, he returns. So when the rapture happens, we know his feet are not going to touch the earth. That won't happen until the second advent. But his coming for the church will be the very physical, uh, visible, uh, 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 bodily coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to take us to be in the Father's house. Um, <clears throat> Bdegs says this about the little adverb again. It, it says, uh, uh, to re- repetition in the same or similar manner, again, once more of, of something a person has already done. So Jesus Christ is going to come back as he uh, came the first time. Jesus Christ will come back in the same way he left. Uh, it's interesting, this expression uh, there in BDAG, it's, it says this word again means once more. It's not talking about multiple comings of Christ, it's talking about a singular event. And then we move to this uh, expression, and receive you to my uh, self. The word for receive is parlambano. Uh, Bdag of parlambano says this: to take into close association, to take to oneself, to take with or along. I will take you to myself, with me to my home. Now you also notice this uh, little preposition uh, translated in English to. It's a little word uh, pros. And TDNT says this, pros with the accusative. This is, a very com- this is very common and denotes movement towards. And notice what TDNT says, spatially, to or towards someone or something 
primarily with an intransitive or a, a transitive verb expressing movement. Now, those two things that I just said, again and to, most of the other rapture position, uh, other uh, alternative positions of John 14 verses 1 through 4, as I'll show you, stumble on those, over those two things. So we can summarize verse 3 this way. It's speaking of Christ's return to spatially remove believers and take them to be with him. And then also in verse uh, 3, there's one other thing that we need to look at here, and that's the little word where. He says that where I am, you may be also. It's the Greek word uh, hopu. And it's speaking of a specific place. Uh, again, bdag says a specific location in the present and is used in connection with the designation of a place. Jesus is taking us to a place. So we can summarize verse 3 this way. Jesus will take the believer to the place where he is. Now, this place can hardly be somewhere on the earth. Uh, if, it, if he was taking us somewhere to be on the earth, then what do we do with what he said previously about the heavenly dwellings? This place can hardly be on the earth. There would be no need for him to build heavenly dwellings spoken of in the preceding verses. And then one more verse is verse 4. In John 14, verse 4, Jesus says, And you know the way where I am going. Uh, the Greek word for translated going is hupago. Bdag uh, says, says this, It's used especially of Christ and his going to the Father. Characteristically in John, and mentions all these verses where that it's used that way, going to the Father. Uh, John 17, 7, 33, and on and on uh, we could go. John 16, verse 5, it, it says this, but now I am going, John 16, 5 is quoted there in Bdeg, but I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me where I am going. So I think upago, going, means the ascension, just like uh, poriomai in verse 2 is also referring to the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these uh, details, we kind of can put them all together and we can develop some, uh, I believe, some conclusions about John 14, 1 through 4. Uh, first of all, Christ would return through his ascension to his Father's heavenly abode. Number two, he would then prepare dwellings uh, temporary dwellings for his disciples. Number three, he would return uh, for his disciples in the future. Number four, his return would be just as personal as was his first coming and ascension. And the last one there is he would physically take believers to be with him by spatially drawing them to himself. The purpose of this event is so that believers could dwell in their prepared temporal heavenly places and be with Christ where he is. This information would serve as a comfort to the disciples who were troubled over the announcement of, of his soon departure. Christ unfolded the reality of this event for the purpose of comforting his disciples. Now, it's, it's important to understand that if what we have said thus far is correct, this is a completely new teaching in the scripture. Uh, there, there is no other teaching like this. You can't find it in the Old Testament. I doubt you could find it anywhere else in, in the Gospels. And this is uh, Gabeline's point. Gabeline says, but here in John 14, the Lord gives a new and unique revelation. He speaks of something which no prophet had promised or could promise, where is it written that the Messiah would come and instead of gathering his saints into an earthly, uh, 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 instead of gathering his saints into an earthly Jerusalem, would, would take them to the Father's house, to the place where he is? This is something new. And that dovetails uh, Dr. Chafer's point. 
The Upper Room Discourse is, uh, in, in which the above passage is found, is the seed plot of that former doctrine which is later developed in the epistles. It is not strange, therefore, for the, for the Apostle Paul to take up this great theme for further um, elucidation. So we have looked at some preliminary reasons why I think we should be open to a rapture interpretation in the, these verses. I've tried to do uh, an exegesis of John 14, verses 1 through 4. And we want to move to the third and uh, final part of this presentation. And we want to take a look at the competition, uh, the alternative positions. Because as I'm reading things, I'm seeing people presenting their views and they don't even give our view any credence at all. It's, it's hardly mentioned and it's very quickly dismissed. But I think when you look at our view in comparison to the competitors, we don't have anything to be embarrassed about here in John 14 uh, verses 1 through 4. So answering the non-rapture arguments. These are various attempts to de-eschatologize the passage. So here they are. These are not all of them, by the way, but these, I think, are the main ones. Number one, this ver these verses talk about the believer's death, John 14, 1 through 4, not a rapture. Number two, these verses talk about the believer's salvation, not the rapture. Number three, these verses talk about Christ's resurrection, not the rapture. Number four, number four is a big one. That's where a lot of people are going today. These verses talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, not the rapture. And then finally, number five, there are those who say, well, this is the rapture. It's just not a pre-tribulational rapture. It's a mid-tribulational rapture or a post-tribulational rapture or a pre-wrath rapture or whatever, whatever you want to make it into. It's just not pre-trib. So let's start with uh, this first one, and this has to do with the believer's death. The idea here is John 14, verses 1 through 4, has absolutely nothing to do with the rapture. It's talking about Jesus coming and getting <clears throat> every believer when they die. So when I die, Jesus is going to come and get me. When you die, Jesus is going to come and get you. Uh, Kenneth Gentry, uh, who's somebody we interact with a lot because he's a leading preterist, uh, in, in his book, The Beast of Revelation, basically takes this view that John 14 verses 1 through 4 is, is not a rapture. Of course, if you're a post-millennialist, you've got to explain John 14, 1 through 4 away some, somehow. So he goes to this view that it's speaking of the believer's death. And that view, I think, uh, uh, falters First of all, with the adverb in verse 3, again, Pauline, or Pauline, uh, again means one time. Now, the BDAG quote that I had up earlier says once more. So if Jesus is coming and getting people every time they die, he's not coming again. He's coming again and again and again and multiple times. It's kind of a strain there. Furthermore, when we die, Jesus doesn't come and get us as I understand it. It's angels that come and get us. Luke 16, 22 says, Now the poor man died and was carried away by angels to Abraham's bosom. When Stephen, the first martyr of the church age, died, Jesus did not even come and get Stephen. Acts 7 and verse 56 says, And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus was standing in heaven welcoming Stephen's arrival. He did not go to get Stephen. Furthermore, uh, when the believer dies, we go to the Lord upon death, not the Lord coming and getting us. Absent from the body is to be what? present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. So I don't think this, this view is workable. Well, the second view says, this is speaking of the believer's salvation, John 14, 1 through 4, has nothing to do with the rapture. It has to do with Christ coming and sort of, uh, in a, I don't know, spiritual sense, mystical sense, receiving us when we trust him as our Savior. Again, that view stumbles over that adverb uh, again, verse 
3, which seems to indicate a one-time coming of Christ. If Christ comes and gets us in some mystical sense every time we get saved, then it would be talking about multiple comings. And John 14, verses 1 through 4 is talking about a singular coming because there are many, many people that get saved every single day for the last 2,000 years of church history. John Walvard uh, makes a point in a Bibsac article he wrote that this view is what we would call a radical allegorization of the text. That's true with all the other positions as well. Walverd uh, basically says it's an allegor allegorization of what he calls localized language describing a heavenly father's house, dwelling places, a place uh, where, where I am, a place where I go. All of that gets sort of absorbed in some, some mystical spiritualized allegorical sense if you believe this is referring to the believer's salvation. Another view, number three, is that John 14 verses 1 through 4 has absolutely nothing to do with the rapture. It has to do with Christ's bodily resurrection from the dead. So in other words, when Jesus rose from the dead, he came back to those disciples. And people are trying to say that's how John 14 verses 1 through 4 has already been fulfilled, not speaking of a future rapture. This view has going for it some things in the context of the upper room discourse. Jesus in the upper room discourse did make references to his resurrection, I believe. In John 14 verses 18 through 20, he says, I will, I will uh, not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After a while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. So people are trying to argue that this John 14, verses 1 through 4, was fulfilled when Christ came to the disciples. He came to them in John 20 and verse 19, <clears throat> which says, <clears throat> so when it was evening on the first day, uh, on, on, on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. So people say, aha, that's the fulfillment of John 14 verses 1 through 4. John 20 verse 26 says, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. John 21, verse 1, after these things, Jesus manifested himself to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. So there is language in John's gospel indicating that Christ indeed did come to the disciples in the resurrection. So people dismiss a rapture interpretation out of hand. However, this view, as much as it has going for it, has uh, some problems. One of the problems <clears throat> relates to chronology. If you bought into what I said earlier, that John 14 verse 2 says, I go, meaning the ascension, and John 14 verse 3 is Christ's coming, I will come again, which would place his coming after the ascension. It's saying his coming is after the ascension. One problem is Christ's resurrection took place before the ascension. So you have this chronological problem. Another problem with this view is the adverb again, verse 3, indicating, I quoted BDAG, that his coming would be like his first coming. The resurrection coming of Christ was a coming from out of a tomb, out of death, not out of heaven. So the, re the uh, resurrection was not like his first coming. And also, where, where is the spatial movement? I showed you pros and parlambano and how that indicates a spatial movement. There is no spatial movement in the resurrection and Christ coming to his disciples. He's not, he's not uh, transmitting them or spatially moving them from one locale to another.
View number four, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this because this is where it looks like a lot of people are moving today. This is speaking of not the rapture, we're told, in John 14, verses 1 through 4, but it is speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost. There are at least three general problems uh, with this, this view. Uh, number one, <coughs> the word again, which indicates that Christ's coming for the church will be like his first coming, which was bodily. And yet when Christ, when the Spirit was given in Acts 2, there was no bodily coming of Christ. Furthermore, where is the spatial movement? Uh, spatial movement um, did not happen when the Holy Spirit came to the church on the day of Pentecost. What about, and also, what about this expression, and receive you to myself? The Holy Spirit did not receive believers in Acts 2, but believers received the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit backwards. John 20, verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts 2, 38, Peter said to them, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, verses 15 through 17 uh, says, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they began laying uh, their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, there are probably three specific arguments that are used by proponents of this position. This idea that John 14 verses 1 through 4 was fulfilled uh, on the day of Pentecost. The first argument that they're using is the phrase, my father's house. And people say that my father's house, John 14 verse 3, the same expression refers to the temple, John 2 16, which Christ analogizes to his body, John 2 verses 19 through 20. Two. The second argument that they're making is that the, the Greek word dwelling, mone, of John 14, verse 2, the only other time that that word is used in the New Testament is in John 14, 23, in the same chapter, which is speaking of the Father and the Son in the believer. It's the second argument that they're using. And the third argument that they're using is the noun mone, or dwelling of John 14, 2, the verbal form of that word, and we all know that words can have a noun form and a verbal form. If I ask you to Google something, I'm using a Google there in a verbal sense, but uh, the noun dwelling of John 14, 2, the verbal form of that word is meno, which is indwelling, which is used in John 15, 4 through 7. The Net Bible, which has a lot of good information in it, sadly goes this direction with John 14, verses 1 through 4. You'll see all of these arguments that I'm, I'm using here in the Net Bible. So let me sort of respond to these one by one. What about this argument that my father's house, John 14, verse 3, is the temple because that's how Jesus uses the same expression in John 2, 16? In the John 2.16 reference, uh, reference to house is masculine, oikos. And the John 14.3 reference to house is feminine, okia, oikia. Although oikos is typically used with the genitive of God to refer to the temple in both the LXX and John 2.16, oikia, our passage, is never used in this manner. So I don't think it, you can connect John 14 with John 2, the way people are trying to do it. The, what about the second argument that the mone, the dwelling, is only used one other time in the Greek New Testament, is used in this very same chapter for 
the indwelling of the Father and the Son in the believer. What about that argument? What about trying to connect John 14, 2 with John 14, verse 23? Response, it is true that Monet of John 14, 2 is used only one other time in the New Testament, John 14, 23. And this usage is just a few verses later in the very same chapter in reference to the indwelling of the Father and the Son in the believer. However, the context of John 14.2 is radically different from the context of John 14.23. George Gunn, I think, does a great job explaining the two different contexts. I just took his material and put it in chart form so we could see it a little bit better. The occurrence of Monet is in John 14.2. The occurrence of Monet is in John 14.23. But the issue in those two passages is very different. The issue in John 14, uh, verses 1 through 14, the early part of the chapter, is sorrow over Christ's soon return. The issue in John 14, verses 15 through 24, is the believer's love for Christ. It's interesting that the verb agapao is not used in the first section, but it's used eight times in the second section. The verb tereo is not used in the first section, but it's used four times in the second section. See, just because two words are used in close proximity doesn't mean the context cannot radically change from one paragraph to the next. I think it was James Barr who called this illegitimate totality transfer. When you define the same word as used in a foreign context and read that identical word into your present context. If I use the word apple, I could be talking about a piece of fruit or I could be talking about a computer. It would be wrong for me to take a context where apple refers to computer and, re and read it indiscriminately into a context where it's talking about uh, fruit or, or some, something different. So the meaning of Monet in John 14 verses 1 through 14 is the, uh, dwell, the, the Father's heavenly abode. The meaning of Monet in John 14 verses 15 through 24 is the spirit indwelling the believer. Now, what about this argument that the noun... Mone, or dwelling of John 14, 2, the verbal form of that word is meno or indwelling in John 15, verses 4 through 7. What about that argument? Equating, here's my response, equating these two words represents an exegetical fallacy known as the uh, root fallacy. I got this from D.A. Carson. The fallacy presupposes that every word actually has a meaning bound up with its shape or its component parts. You know, you can't go to the root of a word and think that every time a word is used from that root, it always means the same thing. Words have, me this is what James Barr's contribution was. Words have meanings based on their context. Context is what gives words meanings. So those are some of the responses I think that we could give to this view that John 14 verses one through four was fulfilled in Acts two on the day of Pentecost. I think the rapture view is strengthened when compared to the non-eschatological positions. I think our view stacks up in other words. Now, one other thing, and with this I'm, I'm finished. There are many people that say, well, it's the rapture, but it's just not the pre-trib rapture. It's what's called the mid-trib rapture. The rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation. Maybe it's the post-trib rapture. The rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. Maybe it's the pre-wrath rapture. The rapture happens three quarters into the tribulation. But look at Christ's words very carefully. Look at what he says in verse one. Do not let your heart be troubled. Look at what he says in verse three, I will come again and receive you to myself. He, in verse one, is expressing comfort. In verse three, I believe he is expressing eminence. He never lays out a series of signs that have to transpire before he can come for his church. Now, these alternative views, you'll notice, <clears throat> violate those two concepts. If you want to make John 14 verses 1 through 4, uh, the mid-trib rapture or the post-trib rapture, I, in my mind, that violates comfort. Maybe I'm a little old-fashioned, but it's not comforting to me to know that I'm going to go into the wrath of God, 
assuming my head is not cut off by the Antichrist, maybe I'll have this hope of being rescued midway through or all the way through or three quarters through. That's not, to me, that's not very comforting. These other views, I think, miss the point concerning what Christ is saying about eminence, that he can come and receive us, verse 3, at any, any time. There's, no, there's never a sign given for his coming for us, his coming for the church. Now, the mid-trib view, you ask Mr. Mid-Tribulationalist, can Christ come back today? No, he can't. 42 months of the tribulation must take place first. Mr. Post-Tribulationalist, can Christ come back today? No, he can't. He'll have to come back at the end of a seven-year tribulation period. Mr. Pre-Wrath Rapturist, can Christ come back today? No, he can't. There's got to be three quarters of the wrath of God on earth uh, first. We are in the only eschatological position which teaches, in terms of a rapture, that Christ can come in the next split second. It can come before this presentation is over. Some of you might be praying for that to happen. <laughs> now, let me just make one quick comment, and then I'll finish uh, regarding... Um, let me take Hal Lindsey's picture off there first. Uh, regarding the post-trib view, the post-trib view has another problem. Uh, I think Tommy referred to this earlier as the yo-yo rapture. You go up and you sort of come back down. Now, if John 14 verses 1 through 4 is talking about the post-trib view where we go up at the end of the tribulation and come back down, there's the problem with the unnecessary heavenly dwellings. Why would Christ prepare heavenly dwellings for us if we are never going to actually be in those heavenly dwellings? Uh, Hal Lindsey, and you guys mind if I quote Hal Lindsey in an academic paper, is that okay? Uh, Hal Lindsey, uh, I think he nailed it in the, in the book, uh, The Rapture, which is a great book. It says, since he says he is going to come in order that we may be with him where he is, we would have to be with him here on the earth. Do you see the problem? The dwelling places in the Father's house would be unused. This makes whole Christ's whole promise ridiculous. Why would he speak of preparing a place for us in the Father's house if he didn't mean that his return would take us there? So in conclusion, I think we can see that there is very good grounds for a rapture understanding of John 14 verses 1 through 4. Even before we get to the text, there's very good preliminary reasons. I think an exegesis of the passage reveals a rapture interpretation of John 14 verses 1 through 4. I think our view fares a lot better than the uh, competing views. As Dr. Hawking said in the previous session, this is not an, just an academic exercise. It's very easy to get caught up in some of those details. But the fact of the matter is Jesus is coming back for the church. Uh, one of these days, he is going to make good on the promise that he spelled out in John 14 verses one through four. I agree with what Dr. Hawking said that there is a satanic energy at work to deny the reality of the soon return of Christ and yet, as we've been studying in this conference, it's an important issue and an important doctrine. And we need to defend the truth that has been entrusted to us. There it is. Do I sound better on this singing mic? <clears throat> not, 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 not any better. Okay. It's time. It's time to shoot. Yes. Okay, Joe. As a pastor, I I use this verse during. Uh, funerals, and yet it's really not for those who have deceased, it's for those who are living. Uh, is it legal to apply it that way? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of pastors use that passage during yeah. funerals, and 
you know, it's, it's not the accurate interpretation. Yeah. What do I do? What do you do? Well, sometimes you just have to punt, you know. <laughs> I mean, when you're at a funeral, it's really not the time to get into an in-depth exegesis, I don't think. <laughs> I, think I think there, if you really are convicted about it, you can, there's other passages that can be used. You know, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, and those types of passages. So if it really bothers you, I think there's a lot of other places, you, places you could go. I, I think at funerals, it's okay to do anything with the Bible, isn't it? Yeah. You can. <laughs> Andy, question about the uh, dwelling places. Um, you spoke about oikos as house, but that is the term often used for the temple, both in the Old and New Testament. Uh, I'm wondering if the heavenly temple might not be a better reference in the sense that we serve in his temple day and night and also the new Jerusalem is an extension of the temple, the heavenly temple, so could that not be acceptable? Yeah, that, that works for me. Okay, mm -hmm. good. What, what about all of those uh, songs about well, going up to, you know, yeah. your mansion in the sky? I, I was at a church where I taught this and they had to change the closing hymn. <laughs> I had to take Mansion out. Yeah, in your estimation, what exactly is the preparation and the place? What is he preparing and how is he doing it? Well, I, I can't answer what uh, the scripture doesn't reveal. Uh, all I know is he's gone into heaven to the unique Father's dwelling place and he is preparing these temporal places for us. There, there is a destiny, I don't mean to minimize that, a destiny for us to fulfill in heaven. There's the uh, uh, Bema Seat judgment and other things. So all I, all I can say is Christ in his present session is somehow preparing us for that heavenly destiny. Well, I don't isn't, know. isn't part of the emphasis that we're going to be with him as his bride? Yes. In other words, we're going to be we're going to be in our dwelling place with him because that's where he is. Uh, you know, it would be something along. That's probably why um, Wycliffe, you know, did mansions or right. something like that. He's the one that introduced that, um, you know, in, in the English translation tradition. Could this have, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, could this have anything to do with, with his actual sacrifice for us, that being the preparation? Because without it, we can't be there. Without it, we can never be wherever it may be in heaven or mansions well, or no mansions. I, I mean, I understand the sacrifice is hotbox one time. It's not an ongoing thing. So I would be kind of, I don't know if I'm understanding you per correctly, but I'd be a little hesitant to say sacrifice. I thought I saw a hand there. Okay, there's a, a finger. Andy, you had the parallels, good ones, all right, between John uh, 14, 1 through 4, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And I believe those parallels are there because the same person is speaking. Paul in the first Thessalonians passage says, uh, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So he's just telling us what Jesus said about it. And then if you continue on without the chapter and verse divisions, I believe he teaches the pre-trib rapture. And it seems to me that it is just that simple. Uh, the same person is giving the information because Paul is speaking, telling us what Jesus said. This is what, this is what the Lord said about this matter. Mm -hmm. And of the times and the seasons you have no need I write unto you, it's pre-trib rapture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I am really open to the idea that when he says to you, I say to you by the word of the Lord, he could have in his mind John 14, 1 through 4. Also, isn't it true that everything in the upper room discourse is new truth? Yes. And it would seem that that collective conclusion would support, uh, you know, that what he's revealing there in John 14, 1 through 3 would be something new, and it's related to the church. Yeah. 
uh, you need to come up, John, and go to one of those mics there. Every eye is on him <laughs> as he comes forward to the microphone. There we go. Um, just wanted to bring out one point. I wanted to look at my computer screen. But, oh. <laughs> uh, um, the word mansion, I have Webster's 1828 dictionary. He lists three different word, di different meanings for the word mansion. But he goes back to the Latin Vulgate and uses the word simply meaning to dwell. Hmm. So that would be an accurate English translation based on the Latin Vulgate. I see. So, so that you're saying that's probably what influenced uh, him. Yeah. Not, 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 you know, we get the idea of imagine something is huge home, but uh, the word means simply to dwell. Okay. Yeah, yeah I guess the. So it's an know, ana anachronistic reading but Imagine. words change you know like the English word let used to mean to prevent but now it changed to where it means to allow right totally reverse its meaning over time okay. how do you see this uh, as uh, related to Peter's question in verse 37 is the chapter break off or is this still continuing the answer to Peter's question? Uh, are you saying in verse... Philip? Which, which verse are you at? Verse, verse 37 of chapter 13. Just verse a couple 37 verses of chapter above. 13. Let me go back here. Peter said to them, Lord, uh, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my own life for you. Uh, Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you before a rooster, uh, well, you know, you know the verse, will not crow, deny me three times. Um, I, I guess at first glance, I don't see it as a continuation. I see it more as a thought that Christ is trying to communicate regarding the trouble in the minds of his disciples regarding his announcement of his soon departure. But I, I, I probably need to look at that more carefully. But that's my gut reaction. Somebody asked what Christ is preparing for us now. It's likely that he's preparing the eternal home, the heavenly Jerusalem. And um, he's working on it, has been working on it for a very long time. He could have created it in six days or six seconds. But I think when the last building block is added to the city in heaven, the last believers added to the church on earth, he's going to come and get us. Yeah, there's also a reference to the New Jerusalem in Galatians 4. So that's a possibility. Okay, any more comments or snide remarks? <laughs> or any other appropriate remarks here? Uh, if not, then you're dismissed until 145. 145. Thank you.